Um, good afternoon, ma'am. Sorry, it was a mistake. Okay, it's okay. It was by mistake, sorry. <laughs> it's okay, no problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, before we're going to start the session, I just wanted to request uh, the core students. Uh, you can just drop in your name who are core students and the most of the students are new. I can see the new names as well. So please drop in the message when you are appearing for your exam. If you are appearing for July exam or September exam, please let me know so we can guide you accordingly. Thank you. Walaikum Assalam, Dr. Negev, Dr. Anam. Okay, Dr. Harin is appearing in July, Dr. Desri, and Dr. Sarwat is also applying for July exams. So we have, so far, we have candidates for uh, July exam. Let's see if we have any candidate for September as well. Okay, and Dr. Anam is also for July exam. Uh, yes, Dr. Rida, this session will be recorded. Okay, we have core students as well. No, no, uh, Dr. Desi, students are asking, is it for MRCOG part one or it is for part two? These guidelines can be used in MRCOG part two? Yes, this is uh, for both part one and part two because this is an updated NICE guideline. Okay, okay, that's really great. So we have Dr. Komal, uh, she's appearing for July exam, MRCOG 1, and then we have Dr. Basil. Okay, uh, Dr. Desi, do you want to say something for the students who are appearing in the September exam? Because uh, from past couple of days, we are receiving a lot of queries because students who have uh, very, their, their learning pace is uh, kind of slow. So they wanted to prepare their exam uh, in July, although they are appearing in September exam. So shall we start um, starting now? I think uh, I think there was no schedule yet for September exam. Yes. It was in their website that it is only for January and July. We are not sure if they will put up a September exam. Yes, exactly. So uh, I think uh, I would suggest for the students who are appearing in the September, they can start their preparation now because most of the students are having very busy schedule. And so that's why I guess they prefer that uh, they shall study like slowly they want to study. So for those students uh, who want, who are their learning pace is slow or they have some busy schedule and they are appearing in the September exam, they can join our July course as well. Yeah, that's, so, okay. that's true. You can start now. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I would request uh, Zaira from the backend team, can we go live? And uh, Maria, please, can you record the session? Because few students are still on duty, so we will help them in getting the recording later on. Uh, Dr. Duha, um, if you are enrolled in the course, you will be getting a PDF for this session. But for those who are not enrolled, they will only have the recording. Okay. Yes, I know, I know. Yes, we will start. Uh, Mafia, can you please start? Because others are busy. Today is Friday. Yes, yes. I'm just going to start. Just give me a moment. Okay, thank you.
Hello everybody, this is Said Mafia, course manager for MRCOG1 in MedExam Expert. So we are here to guide you all for MRCOG1 July exam. For those students who are appearing in September exam, they can join us as well. So for now, I want to introduce my our very respectful senior mentors, Dr. Helmi. He's the chief mentor for MRCOG part one since very long. And then we have our very respected mentor, Dr. Desri. She is with us. Hi, Dr. Desri. Hello, Mafia. Hello, everyone. Hi, welcome to the session. So, uh, I just wanted to give you a brief introduction about my mentor. So we have our pillars uh, for MRCOG1. We have Dr. Ramya with us, Dr. Mevish, and Dr. Mariam. So before that, I just want to give you a brief introduction to why we want to study now, because a few of the students are still thinking that our exams are in July, why we start studying now. I guess uh, we should uh, start studying a month before, two months before, three months before. We all have uh, these kind of questions in our mind. So why studying now is important. It is because we have to plan our future and we have to organize our things uh, before it's uh, we should not delay our things or uh, you can say that on the 11th hour we always get up with some mishaps so always try to prepare your things before and for mrcog one we all know that it's a very important and a bit difficult exam so we have to prepare it before the time okay so I just wanted to give you a brief introduction how we're going to prepare you for MRCOG part one under the guidance of our experts. So what I'm going to do is in our course, we have uh, for those students who wanted to start their preparation earlier because they think that their pace is a bit slower than their colleagues or other students. So we have prepared an initial phase in which they can do self-study by themselves. In, in that phase, we have a pre-course uh, schedule made by our senior mentors. So what we're going to do that, uh, we have provided with all the recorded lectures of all important modules. For example, if we say that it's anatomy, we have recorded lectures for anatomy and uh, PDFs on anatomy will be provided on our website. Once you are studied all the anatomy, important points of anatomy, which you think these points are important, you can just start. Mafia. No voice. Yes, Mafia, you got cut off. Let me send her a message, okay? Maybe no problem. So let me just continue what she's saying. Okay, so you will be provided a topic test for every subject. Oh, she's back. <laughs> That was her screen, so I cannot read it anymore. So just bear with us. This will be uh, the introduction will only take um, ten to fifteen minutes, okay? And then we will start with the webinar, and then after the webinar, we will be having uh, some case scenarios. Uh, this is um, for part one and part two because this is a nice guideline. I updated nice guideline, so this is beneficial for both uh, students taking part one and part two exams. So sorry for the disconnection. Hope I'm really um, I'm audible now. Yes, yes, you're audible now, Mafia. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. So what I was about to say that I was just giving you a brief introduction about our course. So after once you are done with all. Uh, done with the PDF, then we, are, we have done the practice in our study room under the guidance of our mentors. So after that, what you have to do is you can just go with the mini mock. So one by one, once all the subjects are clear with the self-study, we will enter to the second phase. What happens in the study, uh, second phase? In the second phase, you can do one-to-one -one interaction with your mentors, with your senior mentors. Then in the live session, we're gonna discuss all the modules with our senior mentors. And then we will get the PDFs of those particular modules on our website. 
After that, in the same way, then we uh, are all the senior mentors will be involved in the study uh, in the study group. They will help you out that how you're gonna solve the SBAs. What are the tips and tricks to solve the SBAs? Then once you're done uh, with the practicing the one module. For example, if you're practicing anatomy, then you're gonna do, what you're gonna do is you will gonna solve a mock of anatomy. Then our senior mentors gonna uh, review your assessment and according to those assessments, they will guide you then how to proceed further. After that, you can uh, revise your, uh, revise that particular module with a flashcard. And definitely Dr. Deji will help all of you in Biostax workshop. Once you have done with all the modules with the same uh, process, then we will have a big mocks, okay? Big mock is exactly on the same pattern uh, that our COG will conduct the exam. So you can practice those big mock on our website and our uh, technical support team will be available 24 by seven with all of you. So what is in the third phase? Once you have prepared all the subject, all the 14 subjects, then we come with the revision phase, okay? So in the revision phase, what we're gonna do is we will do focused module-wise revision. We will revise all those 14 modules with the mentors. We will discuss important exam-like questions, which we usually call recalls. And then uh, after that, there will be daily discussion with the mentors. There will be high yield points will be discussed in the study group. And yes, the most important thing that there will be a psychological booster that how to deal with the stress in the, you can see that in the last week of your exam and till the day of your exam, our support, our, the support of our mentors, support from our team will be with all of you, okay? So how we're gonna do that, we have three steps. First, we're gonna do that self-study, self-study with the mentors. Then we have live session with the mentors. And after that, we're gonna revise all those 14 subjects Subjects. And if we follow this, uh, uh, you can see the schedule, then this way you're going to pass your exam. The one main key is to pass the exam is you have to be consistent, you have to be organized, you have to be focused. No need to divide your focus. What the biggest mistake we all do is we st we're starting grabbing uh, the knowledge or the information from uh, different particular platform. I'm not saying you just go and uh, uh, book the exam or book the course with med exam expert. But if you are dealing with some course, if you are dealing with some uh, revision, uh, you can say course or any uh, preparation course, then stay your focus with one course. Don't jump into the multiple courses or multiple uh, institutes who are preparing them for MRCOG1. This way you're gonna lose your focus. The moment you lose your focus, you're gonna, you're gonna waste all your money. You're gonna waste all your time each and everything. So please be focused. First of all, get a uh, research that which course you need, because uh, I always say this to my students that uh, you already know that we are earning so hard, like we are uh, working so hard, we are preparing so hard for exams. So don't waste your time, don't waste your money. Just uh, um, just make a good research that which course you need it, which uh, you can say that uh, which guidance you need it. This way you're gonna uh, pass your exam, okay? Just be focused. So this is our study plan, uh, which is for the live session. You can get the, if you want the pre-course study plan, you can get uh, uh, as well from our platform. So our first session will be of physiology, which is of 2nd of February, uh, Dr. Helmi, our most senior mentor, chief mentor for MRCOG1. Uh, he will conduct the session by 8 a.m. GMT. So this schedule will also be provided to all of you, you can uh, get it from our platform. So uh, I would request the backend team, Fatma, can you please share your contact number? So if anybody wants to take the schedule or any guidance, they can contact you. Thank you. So this is the feedback from our last uh, batch, September exam. Hopefully we'll get the same result. Our, uh, our success rate was 95%, Alhamdulillah. So this is, uh, these are the few of the snapshots which I've shared with you. Our feedback videos are on page, our reviews are on page. You can just go and check it out. You can ask from the uh, past students that how was their experience and everything. Just uh, do your good research and start your preparation now because we have now very less time for July batch. So please just uh, start studying, okay? So uh, you can even you can visit our uh, free course library. It's it's available on our application as well. So I'll uh, Fatma, can you please share the link of free library as well? You can just go check out the questions. Um, in fact, 
can uh, check out the questions, mock exam uh, sessions, each and everything is available. Uh, even in fact, books are available on a free library. You can just uh, just go and grab that library as well. So uh, for all the MRC one uh, webinar attendees for 72 hours, we have 60% discount for all the students who are appearing for July exam and September 23 exam. So if anybody wants to uh, take guidance from Dr. Desri, from Dr. Helmi, Dr. Mevish, or Dr. Rame, you can just join our course and you can start preparation with us, okay? If you have any of you have any question, you can ask us. So this is a this is a, a view of our library. What you have to do is once uh, the our application is available on Play Store, as well as uh, you can download it from the iPhones you, you have uh, as well, okay? So uh, first of all, what you have to do is you have to click here on free library, then you have a mock exam, then you have, a, in fact, you have a full free library as well. You can practice all your questions on a free library. So uh, it's it's very easy, it's user-friendly if you are going for your work, if you are on your way to go to visit your hospital or any other thing, you can just uh, use it uh, while doing any sort of work you are uh, you are doing, okay? So if you have any sort of question, please do ask me. I want to ask you, um, when is the first session will start, live session will uh, start in the course? Yeah, first session will be starting from 2nd of February 2023. I have shared the schedule as well. You can see it from here. Okay, duration of the session is depends upon, uh, you can say sometimes it's two to three hours, or if a student wants to clear their queries, it can be extended, uh, you know, half an hour more. If anybody wants to clear their uh, any of queries, so we can extend the session as well. Yes, uh, once I'll finish this, uh, Dr. Sneha will start the CTG. Uh, books will be provided. If you get this course, you don't need to buy any other thing. All the material, everything, books, sessions, uh, PDFs, uh, recalls, each and everything will be included in this plan. So you don't need to uh, see anywhere else if you buy this uh, course, okay? You just have to register yourself. Also, we provide all the resources, the books to, for our uh, course students. We give them the PDF yes. file. Everything will be provided. You don't need to go anywhere else. Okay. So, I so if you have, yeah, Dr. Desi, you can start. If uh, if anybody of you have any question, you can write in the chat box because I don't want to take your uh, precious time anymore. I'll answer all your queries in the chat box, okay? Yes, uh, Dr. Femi, I will share the uh, free library link in a minute, okay? Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much for listening to me and now you can uh, proceed with your lecture. So thank you so very much, everybody. Dr. Desi, you can start with your session. Thank you. Thank you, Mafia. Thank you. Hold on a second, okay. Okay, so thank you everyone for attending this live webinar. This is uh, sponsored by Medexam Expert. So we do live webinars so that um, you know how we conduct our lectures, okay? So before I start, let me, uh, let me know if I am audible, if my voice is loud and clear. Yes, Dr. Desri, your voice is clear and audible. Thank you. Okay, all other questions that will be uh, that you will be asking about the courses, uh, we will answer it at the end of the live webinar, like the fees, how much is the fees, okay? The link to the free library, okay? Mafia will answer that after the webinar. So let us start now. So this is an updated NICE guideline, NG299, fetal monitoring in labor. We have an existing um, 
uh, webinar about CTG in our YouTube channel. Okay, but that was based on the old guideline. So what we will do now is I will I will share to you the old guideline and I will emphasize what is um, what has been changed. Okay, but before we start, we will of course talk first about the basic. Okay, so every uh, for those who are enrolled in the course, you know me. I'm Dr. Desiri. Okay. I'm one of the most, most senior mentors or most old mentors of MedExam expert. I started with them since 2017. Okay. So in every diagnostic procedure, in every laboratory investigation, of course, you are doing those laboratory investigation for a purpose, right? You are doing it because you wanted to guide that to you in, in your management. For example, you want to take your uh, you want to take the CBC, so you wanted to check for anemia and to treat that anemia. So the purpose of our CTG or your electronic fetal monitoring is to assess a fetal well-being. So what is the purpose of assessing a fetal well-being? It is because uh, it will guide you on the management and it will prevent um, adverse outcome like fetal death. And it will decrease unnecessary intervention like cesarean, cesarean section. Before we proceed, there are important terms that you have to know. For example, cardiotochograph. What is a cardiotochograph? Cardiotochograph is a tracing, okay? That is the, the, the result of your electronic fetal monitoring. Cardiotochography or your CTG or your electronic fetal monitoring, which is now known as electronic fetal monitor, monitoring or your EFM, it is the process of doing your cardiotopograph or your electronic fetal monitoring. Intermittent auscultation. When you say intermittent auscultation, you are not using your CTG machine. What you are using is your handheld Doppler or your Pinard stethoscope or your ordinary Lithman stethoscope. Okay. So you have two types of cardiotopography, your NAS test test and your contraction stress test. And you also have your fetal scalp electrode for internal monitoring and in intrauterine pressure catheter or your IUPC. We will discuss this all in details in the next few slides. So before you will be able to understand the basic concepts on interpretation, interpretation of CTG or your e electronic fetal monitoring, of course you have to know the parts of your electronic fetal monitor. So all of us are practicing clinicians. So I'm sure even if you're a fresh graduate, you know, what are the parts of your electronic fetal monitor? So you have your fetal monitor, of course. You have your graph paper. paper. You have transducers, okay? Usually two trans transducers. The transducer for sensing fetal heart rate, the transducer for sensing your uterine contraction, and the fetal movement counter, this one, okay? So this is your electronic fetal monitor. And this is how it is applied on the maternal abdomen, okay? So this diagram, I show this to you because there is something wrong with this diagram. Can you point out what is wrong in this diagram? Anyone who wants to answer? Can you notice something that is wrong in this diagram? Okay, let me tell you what is wrong, okay? So your, your toho dynamometer or your transducer for sensing uterine contraction should be placed at the maternal Top. fundus. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it should be at the maternal fundus. Okay, so, so I'm changing it. So this one should be the area where, it, where your toho dynamometer or your tochometer should be placed. The area of the uterine fundus because it is where the, the strongest uterine contraction can be felt. Contraction. Yes. Mm -hmm. And your transducer for sensing fetal heart rate should be placed where? It should be placed at the fetal back. So it should be on the lower portion, okay? And another mistake in this diagram is, this is an ECG monitor. So you can see here the blood pressure, the heart rate, the pulse, okay? So the, the screen should be like this, okay? So this is how your electronic fetal monitoring should be placed in the maternal abdomen. The toho tochometer or toho dynamometer in the maternal fundus, the, the transducer or the fetal doppler should be at the fetal back and the monitor should be looking like this, okay? So this is a telemetry station. For all of you who doesn't know telemetry station, this is a centralized fetal 
telem uh, telemetry monitoring workstation. If you can remember um, your uh, days in the ICU, okay, in the intensive care unit, you will see there a centralized monitor for cardiac monitors, right, for the ECG. It is it works the same way. Why am I mentioning this to you? Because this is mentioned in the recent guideline. Before it was not mentioned. So in the 2022 December 14 guideline of the NICE, telemetry is mentioned. Okay, so the only thing that they mentioned there is, uh, of course, you have to be sure that your electronic fetal monitoring is working properly. And uh, in case there is a signal loss or maybe a blackout, you should be having an additional power source for this telemetry station or for all your electric electronic fetal monitor. So that's the only portion in the guideline that mentioned about telemetry. So for all of you who are not familiar, this is how a telemetry centralized fetal monitoring workstation looks like. So you can see here, you can monitor four, four um, electronic fetal monitors at the same time. So we have two types of electronic fetal monitoring. Okay, we have your external and we have your internal. For your external fetal monitor, we can use this antenatally or intrapartum. Please everyone kindly turn off your microphones. I will be grateful. Thank you. Because this will affect the recording, okay? So we have two types again. We have your external fetal monitor. This is one which you are all familiar with. And we have your internal, okay? For the external, we have your non-stress test or the contraction stress test. This is the procedure that we do with your electronic fetal monitor. And for the internal uh, electronic fetal monitoring, we have your fetal scalp electrode and your IUPC or your intrauterine pressure catheter. Okay, so what is the difference between your non-stress test and your contraction stress test? So when you say non-stress test, you look at the relationship between fetal movement, and the fetal heart rate. So we know that when the autonomic nervous system of the fetus is intact, every movement of the fetus will cause a corresponding increase in the fetal heart rate, okay? So the problem here, because this is an external fetal monitor and the transducer for sensing fetal heart rate is very sensitive. It has the technology of the ultrasound. So it can pick up even the heart of the mother. So the transducer for the fetal uh, heart rate can pick up also the heart rate of the mother. So how will you know the difference between the maternal heart rate and the fetal heart rate? Uh, it's simple, okay? So the maternal heart rate by, uh, it's usually lower than the, the normal fetal heart rate. But if you want to be more accurate, you have to attach a pulse oximeter so that you will be able to differentiate between maternal pulse and the fetal pulse. And if you don't have pulse oximeter, what you can do is you can palpate the maternal pulse manually, okay? So the transducer for sensing uterine contraction is also a, a very sensitive um, uh, transducer. It can pick up um, uh, the strength, uh, it, it, it can pick up the strength of the uterine contraction, but it is only qualitative, no, it's not quantitative. So usually the maternal uh, contraction is measured in millimeters mercury, okay? But this, since this is external, you do, cannot uh, compute for, uh, you cannot have the actual uh, measurement of the strength of the uterine contraction. So for the contraction stress test, another type which we can use uh, using our external fetal monitor, uh, this, um, uh, look look at the relationship between the contraction and the fetal heart rate, okay? So how will you have the contraction? Usually we use oxytocin drip or the pitocin, and sometimes we use, or most of the time, use the nipple stimulation, okay? So we induce um, contraction to the, to, the, to the uterus so that we know how the fetus will react, okay? how the baby will react during uh, actual labor. So we use this antenatally, okay? For the internal uh, monitoring, uh, usually this is only intra intrapartum, okay? We cannot use this uh, antepartum, why? Because the number one requirement for your internal fetal monitoring 
is ruptured membranes, okay? Your, your, your bugs should be broken. The, the water should be, the, the, the sac should be broken, okay? Because why? We attach the scalp electrode, of course, by the name in the scalp, okay? These are fine wires connected to the monitor. But also, of course, you can, you can attach the scalp electrode in any parts of the fetus, but better on the scalp, okay? And we also have your intrauterine pressure catheter. So this intrauterine pressure catheter, you cannot see here in the diagram, but wait, let me. Okay, so you cannot see here, but usually the, in, you follow the laser pointer, okay? You, usually the intrauterine pressure catheter is in between the fetus and the uterus, okay? So, so that when the uterus contracts, the intrauterine pressure catheter will get that strength and it will record it in Montevideo units. We measure our contraction in Montevideo units. Later on, I will explain to you how to calculate the Montevideo units, okay? So how do you read the tray? So let's now go to reading the tray. So this is your uh, cardiotopograph or your tracing, okay? The upper portion is where your fetal heart rate is, okay? The lower portion is where your contraction is, okay? The numbers on the side represents your fetal heart rate and below, this is the, uh, the strength of the uterine contraction or the Montevideo units, okay? So sometimes you will see through two tracing here if it is a twin pregnancy. The newer fetal monitors will have the maternal heart rate also included, okay? So as I've mentioned, you can know the difference between the, the fetal heart and the maternal heart because, because the maternal pulse is usually lower uh, from the fetal heart. So you should be very, very caref careful in interpreting which is which, okay? And you can see arrows. These are the areas where the fetus move, okay? These are fetal movement, okay? And you can see here, uh, whenever there's fetal movement, there is acceleration. We usually read the trace using the mnemonic C bravado. Every one of you knows that, okay? So contraction, baseline rate, variability, acceleration, deceleration, overall assessment. So the first secret to knowing the correct interpretation of your CD CTG is knowing your graph paper, okay? So this is a blank graph paper. So the first thing that you should look at is the numbers on the graph paper. Okay, because these intervals could be different at some time. For, for this example, you can see here, let me change my... Please turn off your microphones. Thank you. So you can see here, this is 30, right? And this is 60. So you can see that the interval is 10 bits per minute. So one square going up in the y-axis is 10 bits, okay? And one square going to your right is 30 seconds. So two squares is one minute. This is very, very important because of the definition of your acceleration and deceleration. So for your acceleration, acceleration is considered an acceleration if it is at least 15 bits per minute, lasting for 15 seconds or more. Okay, so this contra uh, this is this abrupt change in the fetal heart rate is less than 15 seconds because one small square is 30 seconds, right? So this is less than 15. This one is half, so this is 15 seconds. And this one is it, it is occupying the whole square, so this is 30 seconds. So just remember, okay, the measurement of your uh, paper. So if, if one small square is 30 seconds, two small squares is one minute. So ten, uh, 20 small squares is 10 minutes, okay? So this is 10 minutes, okay? So you can have contractions like this or contractions like this, okay? So we always mention our contraction in 10 minutes, 10 minutes trace, okay? So you can say two in 10 or four in 10, okay? We will go, that, uh, we will go to it one by one, okay? So this is another paper, okay? We can see here, you can see, you can see, I told you the first thing that you should look at is the number. So you can see here, this is 60. So this is 10, 10 bits per minute, this is 70, okay? So for example, 
you have contractions like this, okay? So how do you calculate Montevideo units manually? So you should measure a 10 minute trace, also always in, in a 10 minute trace, okay? So in a 10 minute trace, you can see here three contractions, okay? One, two, three. Okay, you can see the baseline is a 20 millimeters mercury and one contraction is 95, it doesn't reach 100. Another contraction is 95 and the other one is 52, okay? So what you can do to measure the Montevideo units is to deduct the highest point from the lowest point. So 95 minus 20 is 75, 75 and 32. And then you sum it up it will give you 182 Montevideo units, okay? So let's take another one, the same procedure. So it's a total of 162 Montevideo units. So why are we doing this? So that we know if the contraction we are giving to the patient is adequate. So an adequate Montevideo unit should be 200 or more Montevideo units. So that means this contraction and this contraction is still not adequate. So you can still augment it with oxytocin, okay? So this is how you compute for your Montevideo units manually. So now let's go to the paper speed. Okay, we have two types of paper speed. We have your one cm per minute, which is the usual paper that we use, okay? And the usual paper that comes out in the exam. So you will always look, you should always look at the, the rate of the CTG paper. So if it is what it, if it was not mentioned, it should be one centimeter per minute because if it is three centimeter, they will always mention it, okay? So uh, the, the speed of the paper, if not mentioned, it is always one centimeter per minute. Okay, so for a one centimeter per minute paper, one small square is, 60, is 30 seconds. For a three centimeter per minute, one small square is 10 seconds, okay? So that's about your paper speed. So this is an actual uh, tracing in one of my patient done um, four days ago. Okay, this patient is a 29 weeks age of gestation patient complaining of uh, pain, okay? So she cannot determine whether it is uh, pain of contraction or pain of fetal movement. That's why I assess if she's contracting or maybe she's in preterm labor. So you can only use your CTG machine in gestations more than 28 weeks. Remember that because less than 28 weeks, the autonomic nervous system of the fetus is not yet fully developed and your interpretation will not be, will not be correct. So this webinar is for um, uh, the, the antenatal fetal monitoring more than 28 weeks, okay, until term. You cannot apply whatever I'm saying in this webinar for uh, fetus less than 28 weeks, okay? So you can see here, that's why she is complaining of pain. The fetus is moving a lot, but she has no contraction, okay? So as, we, you, as, as you all know, what is contraction? Contraction is uh, uh, the muscles of the uterus contracting and pushing the baby against the cervix. So it will... It will um, uh, result into cervical dilatation, okay? So how do you measure your contraction? So you always count, as I've mentioned, contraction in 10 minutes. So this one, how many is this? This is three, two to three in 10, okay? So from the beginning of your contraction until the end, that is the duration. From the beginning of one contraction until the beginning of the next, that is called frequency. And the interval between two contractions is what we call interval, okay? So the, the, the height of the contraction is what we call strength, which I explained a while ago, the Montevideo units. And for this graph, we have two to three, you have here. Why two to three? Because one, two, and you have half, okay? So that's two to three in 10 minutes. So what do you, what do you mean by tachysystole? When you say tachysystole, this is, five contraction in 10 minutes, five or more contraction in 10 minutes. This is important because this is now included in the recent NICE guideline before they don't include um, contraction in the classification of the CTG paper or the CTG trace. 
Now let's go to your baseline rate. Okay, the second in the mnemonic, Dr. C. Bravado. So contraction, finish, baseline rate. So you always take your baseline in the area where there is no deceleration or where there is no acceleration. Okay, so we have to take the baseline from this area to this area. So this is your baseline. You always draw in the exam, you can draw uh, a line. Okay, in the, I, I, I'm not sure because this exam, I'm so sorry, the exam is already computerized because during my exam, it is a paper, paper, paper exam. So I can draw a line so I can, I can check the, the baseline heart rate. So you can just, just look at the, the numbers. So you can see here 150. Let me remove first. Okay, so you can see here 150, 160. 170, 180. So the contraction is running from 150 to 160 beats per minute. Okay, so for the normal baseline fetal heart rate, 110 to 160 is normal. Less than 110, 110 is bradycardia and more than 160 is tachycardia. Okay, so the answer here is the baseline heart rate is 150 to 160 beats per minute. Okay, so now let's go to variability. So variability is a bit to bit, okay, difference. It is from baseline, peak to throw. When you say peak to throw, so when you interpret a CTG, you, you usually interpret a 20 minute race or a 10 minute race, okay? When you talk about variability, these are the fine oscillations, okay? For example, here in the number one example, the oscillations will be like this, absent, okay? For number two, you have minimal oscillations, okay? That is um, bit to bit, from one bit to the other. So for example, this one is one bit, another bit like that, okay? So we have five types of variability. So you have your absent represented by number one. Absent, you can see here almost zero, almost no oscillations. You can have minimal, which is one, to five bits per minute, you have moderate, five to 25, mark more than 25 and sinusoidal, okay? So for the normal variability is moderate, okay? So this is your normal number three, okay? So five to 25 bits per minute is a normal variability. So mark variability is, um, this is already non-reassuring. So this is amber color and sinusoidal is always abnormal, okay, sinusoidal or so tooth pattern is always abnormal, okay, remember that. So now let's go to your acceleration. Okay, acceleration, as I've mentioned, is an abrupt increase, okay, abrupt increase, that means like that, okay. So when it is like this, that is not abrupt, that is a slow increase. So you have abrupt increase like this, at least 15 bits per minute lasting for 15 seconds. That's why it is important for you to know the, the, the speed or the rate of your paper or your CTG so that you know if the acceleration is lasting for 15 seconds or going up 15 bits per minute. So let's take one example. So you can see here how many abrupt increase. You can see here, this is the baseline. You can see here six, okay, six abrupt increase. So just look at one one acceleration and then compute, okay? For example, let's take this one. The baseline is 140 bits per minute. This acceleration, this is 160. So this is reaching another square. So this is 170. So 170 to one, four, minus 140 is 30 bits per minute. So it fits in the criteria for acceleration because it's 30 bits per minute. Is it lasting for 15 seconds? Yes, because it occupies one square, which is 30 seconds. So this is 30 seconds. So this is an acceleration. So acceleration, acceleration. So you have six accelerations, okay? So we can check here if our computation is true, is correct. You can see here at the end of the 24 minutes, you have six acceleration, okay? And then at the end of 12 minutes, you have four acceleration. You have one, two, three, four. I don't know what this deceleration is, okay? But I don't consider anything here as deceleration. I cannot see, okay? So this is also uh, an actual patient of mine, but this is very old, 2021, okay? So now let's go to another one. I wait, I mentioned something here. 
I forgot to mention. So prolonged acceleration is more than two minutes, but less than 10 minutes, okay? So remember that a prolonged acceleration is more than two minutes, but less than 10 minutes. Because if it is more than 10 minutes, it is no longer prolonged acceleration. We have another term for that, which I will mention later. Okay, so a prolonged rise of more than 10 minutes. Okay, this is the this is what I'm talking about. A prolonged rise of more than 10 minutes is not considered acceleration, but a change in baseline. So you can see here your baseline. So this is 130. Okay, so you can see here 120 if you can read it, if you can see it. Okay, 120, 130, 140, 150. 120, 130, 140, 160. Okay, so this is by 20s, okay? So this is 140 baseline. You have here acceleration, okay? So if you have an acceleration like this, more than 10 minutes, you know that 10 minutes is 20 small squares. So you can see here, it doesn't go back to the baseline. Okay, so that is a change in the baseline and it is not, it is no longer called an acceleration. The presence of acceleration, even with reduced baseline, is generally a sign of a healthy fetus, okay? So now let's go to deceleration. Definition of your deceleration is the exact opposite of your acceleration. So it should be less than 15 beats per minute from the baseline and lasting for more than 15 minutes for 15 minutes or more. Okay, so we have three types of acceleration. Before, uh, you usually classify it as type one, type two, type three, but for the nice, they classify it as early, late, and variable. So when you say early, it comes with a contraction. The start and the finish is the same as the contraction. Okay, you can see here. For the late, the start of the deceleration uh, they, it starts at the end of the contraction, okay? So it is not mirror image. And for variable deceleration, you can see here, you can see the early and the late, they are slow deceleration. That means they decel and recover slowly, okay? For variable deceleration, how can you differentiate it from early and late? The variable deceleration are usually abrupt, okay? Usually like this. You can imagine a letter V, okay? That's why it's called variable. No, it's only my mnemonic. So when you see V deceleration, it's usually a variable deceleration, okay? So I have a mnemonic for, for this. Okay, so deceleration, V will chop, okay? You use variable for cord compression, early for head compression. A doesn't represent anything, but you can put here acceleration, okay? If there is acceleration, that means the baby is okay, okay? And late for placental insufficiency. So I just put this mnemonic because at the, at the pressure of the exam, you tend to confuse, you tend to interchange between cord and placental insufficiency. Early, you know, early it's head compression, okay? But sometimes me, I'm, I am guilty of that myself. I sometimes change uh, cord compression with placental insufficiency. So with this mnemonic, you know that VILCHAP, V stands for C, it's cord compression, okay? So early deceleration, as I've mentioned, uh, you have the onset of the deceleration together with the start of the contraction. So the, the nadir or the lowest point represents the highest peak of the contraction. Okay, so again, you see this, okay. So these are called mirror image. Okay, so summary, it corresponds to head compre uh, compression, coincides with the onset of the contraction and ends with the contraction. The nadir of the deceleration corresponds with the peak. It is mirror image. And remember, this is the most important sentence here. Early deceleration are not pathologic. Okay, early deceleration are not pathologic. Late deceleration. The onset of the contraction doesn't correspond to the nadir. Okay, so the contraction, the deceleration occurs after the contraction. So it corresp corresponds to placental insufficiency. Real chop, remember? Variable deceleration, that's why it is called variable because it 
occurs anytime. It can be an early, it can be a late. So if you see in a trace, all the types of deceleration, so that is a variable deceleration. So this one is a W shape, okay? This before in the old guideline, it is a feature concerning characteristic or concerning feature. But in the new guideline, this is no longer included. I will tell you later on. So it corresponds to cord compression. Okay, the, the onset doesn't coincide with the, the contraction. It may occur at the beginning or the end or anywhere in the contraction. So that is how the fetal response to hypoxic stress. Okay, first is the deceleration. Next is the loss of acceleration. This is the reason why acceleration is not included in your classification because the acceleration... Uh, uh, you cannot classify a CTG based on acceleration. However, if there is acceleration, that means that your fetus is okay or healthy. So because the acceleration get lost even before, even after uh, the deceleration. So at the first thing uh, that the fetus will do will have deceleration in the fetal heart rate and then the acceleration will be lost. And then there will be release of catecholamines. This will increase the fetal heart rate, okay? Um, there will be peripheral vasoconstriction, so to redistribute the blood to the most uh, important organs, okay, then there will be compensated response. The fetus will recover. However, if the fetus is immunocompromised, okay, uh, or fetus is in acidemia, so the fet fetus cannot compensate anymore, okay, so it will eventually lead to a loss of baseline variability and decrease in heart rate. So this is the stepwise approach. So you can predict, you can predict what will happen to the fetus. This is why CTG is very, very important. So when there's a hypoxia, you will have deceleration. So you can predict that when you see deceleration, the next thing that will be lost or will disappear will be the acceleration. And then you will have a change in baseline. Okay? If the patient compensates, the baseline will be stable again the variability will be normal. But if the, uh, the fetus cannot uh, compensate, the baseline will be unstable and there will be changes in variability and it will go to the end stage, which is myocardial failure or death, which we, are, are, which we all are afraid to happen. Okay, so this is A, B, C, D, E approach, okay? So now let's go to the exact difference or the NICE guideline, the new NICE guideline published in the 14th of December, 2022. For those of you who are taking exam in July, uh, you should be expecting that probably they will be changing all the questions about the CTG, okay? So this is important for both part one and part two, okay? So if in case in the exam, if they haven't changed the exam, uh, you will still encounter questions about fetal blood sampling. So that means they're still using the old guideline, okay? Because in the new guideline, there is no, the uh, fetal sampling has no role. That's why in this webinar, I put it side by side so that in case they will give you the old guideline, you will still know, okay? So as I mentioned, intermittent auscultation, Okay, you, 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 use, uh, you hear the fetal heart using your handheld Doppler, your Pinard stethoscope, or your uh, ordinary stethoscope, okay? So how do you measure the heart rate? So this is a favorite exam question, okay? So in the first stage of labor, established first stage of labor, when you say established, Okay, this is more than four centimeters, okay? You should be measuring the, uh, the, the fetal heart rate one full minute after each contraction and at least once every 15 minutes. While in the second stage of labor, it is the same after contraction, one full minute, but it is after every five minutes, okay? That's the difference, okay? So when you notice an increase of 20 beats per minute or more from the start of labor or a deceleration, you have to do intermittent auscultation more frequently. By more frequently, we mean every three contractions. You don't have to wait 15 minutes. So every three contractions, you measure the heart rate. And you make a full review. Antenatal, does the patient has antenatal risk factors or intrapartum risk factors? 
if the patient has, and if you hear the deceleration, then you call for her help and advise the patient to do continuous CTG monitoring. And at the same time, if you don't have a continuous fetal monitor, then you should arrange transfer to midwifery led or obstetric led unit, okay? If in case you have a fetal monitor and you monitor the patient for 20 minutes, okay, and you see that there's no deceleration, then you can go back to intermittent auscultation unless the patient decides to remain on continuous CTG. So you all have to consider what the patient request is. So once you put the patient on continuous CTG, so we have uh, reasons why you, we put patients on continuous CTG. First, antenatal risk factors, okay? This, that means this patient is not in labor. So if these are all the risk factors, previous cesarean section or other full thickness scar, so you can read this in the guideline. The guideline is 41 pages long. So I put here, this one I highlighted because this has been amended, okay? In the 2022 guideline. So you have pre-existing diabetes and GDM requiring medication, okay? And here, nancephalic uh, fetal growth restriction below third centile, uh, small gestational age fetus below the 10th centile with other risk factors like abnormal Doppler, reduced liquor, reduced growth velocity, advanced gestational age or post-term fetuses, anhydramnios or poorly hydramnios and reduce fetal mo movements before the onset of contraction. So why they say so? Because if there are reduced movement, mo fetal, fetal, fetal movement during labor, it is not included as antenatal risk factor, okay? These are the intrapartum risk factors listed here. So when you say intrapartum, this is happening during labor, okay? So when you have contraction, lasting for longer than two minutes, this is what you call hypertonus, okay? So when you have hypertonus or you have tachysystole, then you have to put the patient on continuous fetal monitor. Presence of meconium, maternal pyrexia. When you say maternal pyrexia, 38 degrees centigrade on one single occasion or 37.5 on two occasions, one hour apart. Okay, chorioamnionitis, pain, different from contraction, fresh vaginal bleeding, blood stained liquor, maternal tachycardia. Okay, maternal tachycardia, you have to measure it two times, 20 minute, 30 minutes apart, more than 120 beats per minute, okay? Severe hypertension, okay? Severe hypertension, when you say severe hypertension, more than 160 systolic and more than 110 diastolic, single reading between contraction, okay? You see here, single reading. You only need one single reading. If you have hypertension, more than 140 systolic or more than 90 diastolic, you have to have two readings, 30 minutes apart, okay? Proteinuria plus two and... Okay, not only proteinuria, it should be accompanied by a single reading of increased blood pressure. Okay, confirm delay in the first or second stage, insertion of regional anesthesia, and the use of oxytocin. So this is always a favorite exam question. So remember, when you put epidural or the patient is on oxytocin, the patient should always be on continuous cardiotopography. Okay. So this is the NICE guideline, okay? This is the old NICE guideline, okay? So you can see here the old NICE guideline. So I will point out to you one by one so that you will know the difference from the old and the new NICE guideline. So we use baseline rate, variability, and deceleration in the old NICE guideline, but in the new, you include contractions, okay? Contraction is included. So in the old guideline, the features are reassuring, non-reassuring, and abnormal. In the new NICE guideline, the reassuring becomes white. It's color-coded, okay? Non-reassuring is amber, and abnormal is red, okay? So these are the criteria or the features, okay? So we have reassuring, it's white. This is normal, 110 to 160 is normal. Okay, this is non-reassuring or amber. So you can see here, 100 to 109 or 161 to 180. No, this one has been removed, okay? 
So you can see here, they only say 100 to 109 is non reassuring or any increase of 20 bits per minute from the baseline from one hour ago, or if you are unable to determine the, base, the baseline. So this is the new NICE guideline. They already removed 161 to 180. Okay, so one, 100 to 109 is not reassuring. And below 100 and above 160, take note, not above 180, 160, okay? Below 100 or above 160 is abnormal. Okay, now let's go to variability. 5 to 25, as I have mentioned, moderate variability is normal, okay? So less than five for 30 minutes to 50 minutes, also in the new guideline. But if you can see here, more than 25 minutes for 15 to 10 minutes, they remove this, okay? They put 10 minutes. So if you have less than five for 30 minutes to 50 minutes or more than 25 for 10 minutes, no more, no, no range anymore, okay? For 10 minutes. So this is non-reassuring, okay? Yeah, Okay, so let's continue. So for abnormal, you still have five for more than 50. Here it is 30 to, wait, huh? Here it is 30 to 50. Here more than 50. Okay, less than five for more than 50 or Remove this, as I've mentioned to you, okay? Change, his, change it to 10, okay? More than 10 minutes or sinusoidal. I told you sinusoidal is always abnormal, okay? So that's the difference in the old and the new NICE guideline, okay? For the deceleration, no deceleration or early deceleration. I mentioned to you early dece deceleration is not pathologic. So no deceleration, early deceleration is always a reassuring feature. So this is white, okay? White, amber, and red, okay? Normal. Variable decelerations with no concerning characteristics, they remove the timing, okay? So no more timing. So any variable deceleration with no concerning characteristic, I will tell you later on what are these concerning characteristics. So this is a white feature, white, okay, reassuring. Okay, so look at the amber portion, variable deceleration with no concerning characteristics, this has been removed because this is already here, okay? So any deceleration with no concerning characteristic is a white feature or a reassuring feature, okay? Variable deceleration, okay, take note of this. Huh? When they say in, in up to 50 minutes of contraction, up to 50 minutes, up to 50 minutes, this has been changed to repetitive, okay? When you say 50 minutes or more, in over 50 minutes, this is repetitive. And less than 50 minutes of the, uh, less than 50%, it is no longer a classification. So look again. Up to 50 minutes of contraction, variable deceleration with any concerning characteristics, up to 50% of the contraction, that means less than 50%, this has been removed, okay? So for 30 minutes, variable deceleration with any concerning characteristics for 30 minutes, this is an amber feature or non-reassuring. If it is more than 50, variable decel or late decel, they call it repetitive, okay? So remember, when they say repetitive variable deceleration, that means your contraction is, uh, your deceleration is more than 50% of your contraction, 50% or more, okay? So when they say repetitive variable deceleration, the variable deceleration is more than 50% of your contractions. Late deceleration, repetitive, so late deceleration, more than 50% of your contraction. And they remove this, okay? They remove maternal or fetal risk, okay? So this is less than 30 minutes, less than 30 minutes. So anything that is less than 30 minutes that is repetitive goes to your amber classification, okay? So for the abnormal, again, repetitive because this is more than, okay? So repetitive variable for 30 minutes or more, This is more, huh? 30 minutes, 30 minutes or more. Because this one is the less, okay? And late deceleration for 30 minutes, this has been removed. 
okay, and acute bradycardia. The category remains the same, okay, normal, suspicious, and pathological. However, when you have normal, that means all features are white, okay. When you say suspicious, one amber feature, one feature is amber, okay. So that means if you have tachycystole, that's already suspicious without any, any of this, without deceleration. A tachycystole is always a suspicious feature, okay. Pathological, one red feature, any one, or two amber features, okay. So the category, categorization is the same. It has never changed, normal, suspicious, pathological. For the features, you will only change white, amber, and red, and you will have to remove all of this, okay. So these are the concerning features, okay? That, that, that's what I'm talking about in the uh, previous slide. So when you say concerning characteristic, it is lasting more than 60 seconds. There is reduced baseline variability within the deceleration, failure to return to baseline, okay? By, uh, is, or failure or slow return, by basic has been removed, okay? So it is no longer included as a concerning characteristic. So W shape or biphasic is removed. No shouldering or loss of previously present shouldering. Okay, when you say, when you say shouldering, the deceleration will look like this. Okay, so this is a shoulder. Okay, so when there is previous shouldering or there is loss of shouldering or no shouldering, so that is a concerning characteristic. When you say failure to return to baseline, this is like this. So it decreased but never recovers. Okay, so loss, loss of variability within the deceleration, that means usually your deceleration looks like this. Okay, so when it is very, very flat like this, there is no variability or no bit to bit variability then that is a concerning feature, okay? So this is the summary, okay? No deceleration or early deceleration or variable deceleration without any concerning characteristics. So that is white, okay? Variable deceleration with any concerning characteristics more than 30 minutes, it is an amber feature, okay? So any repetitive that is less than 30 minutes, that is amber, less than 30 minutes, amber. More than 30 minutes, repetitive, that is abnormal, okay? So any, any repetitive deceleration, whether it is variable or late, more than 30 minutes, that is red. And acute bradycardia is always an abnormal feature. So actually the new NICE guideline has been a lot more easier than the previous uh, classification. So I, I, like, I love this new classification more than the previous classification. It is easier, okay? So how do you manage? So let us change first the features. Normal, as I've mentioned, all features are white. Suspicious, one feature is amber. Pathological, one feature is red or two amber features, okay? So basically the, the management is the same, except that, okay, uh, of course, you have to talk to the woman, but they have removed this. You have to perform a full risk assessment. And here you can see uh, you don't have to inform an obstetrician in the suspicious feature, okay? You don't have to in inform an obstetrician or a senior mid midwife. This has been removed, okay? And then uh, note that if accelerations are present, that means fetal acidosis is unlikely. So this is in the new guideline. So let's see here in the pathological, what has been changed. Of course, when you have one amber, two ambers or one red, you have to obtain a review by a senior obstetrician or a senior midwife, okay? You have to exclude acute events. You have to perform full risk assessment and document findings, correct underlying causes, okay? If the cardiotocograph trace is still pathological after implementing conservative measures, what are these conservative measures? I will tell you in the next slide, okay? If the, the CTG is the same, okay, that is still pathological after you apply the conservative measure, then you have to obtain further review by an obstetrician and a senior midwife. You can offer the digital scalp stimulation, okay? 
evaluate the whole clinical picture. Uh, so sorry, huh? I removed this because the digital scalp stimulation is here, okay? Here. Fetal scalp stimulation, digital scalp stimulation is here, okay? The conservative measure. So if it's still the same after digital scalp stimulation, then you have to inform the, mid, the midwife or senior midwife or the senior obstetrician that's still the same. So if, evaluate the whole clinical picture and expedite birth. Okay, so this fetal blood sampling has been removed, okay? There are no fetal blood sampling in the new NICE guideline, okay? So this is the new. So if there is an acute bradycardia or prolonged deceleration, 30 minutes or more, so you have to urgently seek, this has not been changed, okay? So you have to, you have to do all of this then. Seek obstetric help, okay? Check if there is an acute event, correct underlying causes, has such as hypotension or uterine hy hyperstimulation. Uh, no more this one, okay? Because this is, sorry. No more this one, okay? You have to uh, prepare for urgent birth or expedite delivery, okay? Of course, you talk to the woman, they remove also this one. This has been removed, okay? So if the fetal heart rate recovers after nine minutes in any time less than nine minutes, then you have to reassess, okay? So these are the conservative measures below. So you have to mobilize or position the patient if the patient is not on epidural, okay? You tell her to get a position that is more most comfortable for her. You offer intravenous fluid if the woman is hypotensive. That means intravenous fluid resuscitation has no role if the woman has a normal blood pressure, okay? So you don't use IVF in correcting fetal heart rate, only if a woman is hypotensive. And then you have to reduce contraction. If the patient is on oxytocin, you stop oxytocin. If the patient is on um, a prostagl prostaglandin pessary, you remove the pessary. If it doesn't change, then you have to give a tocolytic of terbutaline 0.25 milligrams subcutaneous, okay? So I... So if you have an acute bradycardia or fetal heart rate deceleration more than nine, three minutes or more, these are the steps or the, the mnemonic is three, six, nine, and 12, okay? So in three minutes, you have to call for help. In six minutes, you, you should be moving to the theater. In nine minutes, the team should be preparing for delivery. And in 12 minutes, the baby should be delivered, okay? So this is the stepwise management first, conservative measure, intravenous fluid if the patient is hypotensive, reduce the contraction if the patient is on oxytocin, digital scalp stimulation. Remember, when you do scalp stimulation, the patient, the baby should respond. So if the baby doesn't have acceleration in fetal heart rate after the dig digital scalp stimulation, that means it is a, a bad prognosis, okay? Fetal blood sampling has been removed, as I've mentioned in the new guideline and expedite delivery. So this is the old guideline. I, I give this to you because I don't know if they will change the question. So if in case they don't change the question, this is the normal, normal values for your pH and your lactate, okay? For the blood, fetal blood sample results, okay? So this is in the new guideline, fetal blood sampling. NICE is unable to make a recommendation about fetal blood sampling because of limited evidence. So they don't use it anymore. In January exam, uh, the, the fetal blood sampling still came out, okay? Because it's January, it was published only in December. So it is expected that the exam will, will be using the old guideline. But for July, or in case there will be September exam, so probably they will remove this old guideline, okay? So we have three scenarios. So I want you not to manage this patient. I want you to interpret the patient's CTG. So let us first read the first case scenario. A 30-year-old uh, patient, 35 weeks of gestation, is admitted in spontaneous labor. She is fully dilated. On examination, the head is 0 palpable per abdomen. 
in left occiput anterior position with minimal caput and no molding. She has made good progress from three centimeters to full dilatation in three hours. She has been pushing for one hour. You are asked to assess the CTG. So your midwife called you to assess the CTG. Okay, so before you take a moment to interpret the CTG, I would like to tell something about the zero fifth palpable, okay? So this is the representation or the diagram of the palpability per abdomen, okay? So when you say zero fifth palpable, it is here in this area. That means no fetal head is palpable in the maternal abdomen. So all the fetal head is down, okay? So when you say two fifths palpable, this is the area of the fetal engagement, okay? That means the head is engaged. This is at station zero, okay? So another important thing here is one, you, you, should, you should know that the engagement is two-fifths palpable. And when the, the head is one-fifth palpable, okay, this is the end wherein you can use your forcep. Okay. So if it is more than one-fifth palpable, you can no longer use your forcep. So you have to take note of this, okay? So zero, two-fifths palpable, station zero, level of ischial spine. One-fifth palpable, it is the last uh, wherein you can use your forceps. So you cannot use mid forceps if the head is more than one-fifth palpable, okay? So please take a moment to, to interpret the CTG and then tell me in the chat box, okay? What is the baseline fetal heart rate? We will use the mnemonic C bravado. Okay. So you can write in the chat box if you can see. I put here the numbers. So if you can see the baseline fetal heart rate, you have to write in the chat box what is the baseline fetal heart rate. Eighty. One sixty to one eighty. That was too too much of a range. Yes, one sixty. Okay. One sixty to one eighty is too much. One sixty to one seventy. Okay, acceptable. One fifty to one sixty. Okay. So here, this is the baseline, okay? This, this is the baseline fetal heart rate. I told you, you have to write, okay? So this is the baseline fetal heart rate. It ranged from 160 to, I think, one, 160 to 170 is okay. I will accept that, okay? So next. 175. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is the next mnemonic? Baseline rate, C bravado, baseline rate, contraction. Tell me, Dr. C bravado. Contraction, how many in 10 minutes? D is determined risk. Determined risk, the patient is preterm, 35 weeks. Okay. Contraction is how many in 10 minutes? So this is one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So how many contraction in ten minutes? One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So one, two, three. So three, three in ten. Okay. So what else? Variability. What is your variability? You can check here from the baseline. Your variability is 5 to 25, right? No, not less than 5, Dr. Muhammad. You can see here oscillations. This is not less than 5. Less than 5 should look like this. 
yes, should look like this, not minimal, one to five. You can see here, you can see here, this normal, yes, Dr. Madhu. This is five to 25. You remember five to 25 is normal, okay? Dr. C, bravado, acceleration. Do you see acceleration? You cannot see acceleration. Deceleration, you can see deceleration. So what type of deceleration is this? Variable. Yes, this is variable deceleration because you can see here, you can see it occurring at the same time after the contraction. It has no pattern. Okay. And it is abrupt. It is not slowly recovering. Yes. So is this a variable or is it a repetitive variable deceleration? Repetitive? Yes, it is repetitive variable deceleration because it is occurring in more than half of the contraction. Yes, Dr. Kulat, very good. Dr. Madhu, Manikam, okay. So this is repetitive variable deceleration. Let us see what the, the answer is, okay. So the preterm, okay, the contraction is four to five. That's acceptable because there are some portion where in, if you take this portion, you can see here four. If you take this portion, you can see only three, okay. So four to five. Baseline rate is 170, very good, 160 to 170. Accelerations, you cannot determine. Variability is five to 10, very good. Somebody answered that exactly, five to 10. So deceleration, this is the old guideline, so we change it into repetitive. So what is your overall impression? So you have here, how many amber features? What is the amber feature, tell me. Red one? Amber, amber, amber. Baseline. Baseline. Mm -hmm. I know. It's not amber. It's a red one. Yes, you are right. Red one. Mm -hmm. Because it's more than 160. Okay. What is another feature? Deceleration. 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 Okay. So is it um red or amber? It will be red. amber or red. red. Red, red, red. It, it is red, yes, because it is more than more than 50. It is a repetitive variable, okay? More than 30 to 60. See, if I remove the cover, it is repetitive. There are variable deceleration lasting for more than 60, okay? So if it is less than, uh, this is 30 minute segments, okay? If it is less than 30 minutes, then it is amber, okay? So this is red, two reds. What is the category? Abnormal. 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 Okay, the answer is here. You are cheating, huh? <laughs> okay, so we have, we have second case scenario. A 35-year-old with an IVF pregnancy is at 42 weeks of gestation. She has been induced into labor and had an oxytocin drip for the last six hours. You are asked to assess the CTG at eight centimeter dilatation. So we are here to classify the CTG only. Okay, so let me give it to you in a bigger picture. Okay, so tell me the fetal heart rate. Uh, contraction first, how many? Four to five. Four Determine to five. The rate. This is post-term. Four to five only. So we, we count, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So how many contraction from here to mm -hmm. here? How many? Five. Okay, five. Okay, so if we take, for example, one, let me write again, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so if we come from here to here, it's one, two, three, four, five. So it is five, okay? Five contractions. What is that? What do you call that? Five contractions. Tachycystole. Yes, it's tachycystole or tachycystole. So contraction is five, a tachy, 
So what else? Contraction, baseline rate. This is post term. Baseline rate. What is your baseline here? 140. 140. 160. 160. 140 to 150. Yes. You always con you always confuse the the deceleration into the baseline. You should be you should be knowing that when you have peak like this, these are the deceleration. Don't confuse this as the baseline. Okay. This is your baseline. So it's how much? 150 to 160. Okay, 150 to 160. Variability. What is the variability? You can see here, excuse me, you can see here? Because these are the area where in there is no deceleration. So what is the variability? Less than five. Less than five? This is less than five? No, this is not less than five. So this is what? Yes, Dr. Muhammad, Dr. Sarah, this is five to 10. No? Five to 10. ten. Yes, so that is, ten. that is normal, right? So what else? Uh, acceleration, do you have acceleration? You cannot see acceleration, deceleration. What type of deceleration is this? There is no deceleration. No deceleration. Are you sure? There is deceleration. There is there Early. The... variable. Yes, Dr. Manika. Variable. This is these are decelerations. Okay. These are decelerations. Okay. However, now we don't we don't consider biphasic as a feature. Yeah. So, but there is a deceleration. Okay. It's a variable. Yes, Dr. Dido, Dr. Sangari, Dr. Adila. This is our variable decelerations, okay? How many decelerations you see in the whole trace? It is occupying almost 100%, right? So these are, I see a variable. This is repetitive, very good. So let, let us see the answer. So these are more than five in 10 minutes. It, it's a tachysystole, baseline rate, you are correct, 155 to 160. Variability five to ten repetitive variables. So, how many features you have? Tell me the features. Tachysystole is what? Amber or red? Yes, amber or red? Red. Red. Tachys Tachysystole. Amber. 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 We only have. We only have two classic, we have only have two. If it is less than five, it is white feature. If it is more than five, it is amber. There's no red for contraction, okay? Okay. Okay, so another feature, which one is it? No acceleration. Acceleration is a feature? Ah, oh, sorry. No, acceleration is not a feature, okay? Repetitive, repetitive, repetitive. Okay, repetitive. Okay, repetitive variable deceleration. Amber or red? Red. Red. Red, red? red. red. Because it's more than 30 minutes, okay? So overall impression, I give it to you again, abnormal. So one red feature is pathologic, okay? So additional case scenario, okay? The patient is post-term. She was put on oxytocin. Unfortunately, the oxytocin was not stopped. And the labor was allowed to continue because the trace was erroneously interpreted as having acceleration. The woman is still eight centimeters dilated. The head is two fifth palpable per abdomen and left occiput posterior with caput and molding. She has made two centimeter progress over the last eight hours. So at this time, this is the CTG. Yes, Dr. Gajatipan, we will share the PDF of the new NICE guideline. Don't worry. Okay. So I will ask the team to share the PDF. Or if you are not enrolled in the course, um, you can search it, uh, NICE guideline, updated NICE guideline in fetal monitoring in labor, NICE guideline 299. It is free. You can download it from the website, from the NICE website. Okay. So these are, this is now the CTG. So the oxytocin was not removed. The patient is on taxis systole. So tell me, what is the baseline here now? One seventy. Yes, one seventy. Okay, contraction. 
is still tacky systole, more than five, no? Five. Five. Okay. Variability. Five, five to yes. ten. Minimum. Five, five to ten. ten. Okay, five to ten. Yes, Dr. Um, Eguriasi. Yes, uh, it is no longer included. The FDS is no longer included. Mm -hmm. Five to ten. Okay, variability. What else? Bravado. Acceleration. You cannot see if there's acceleration. Deceleration. Is there deceleration? Yeah. Yes. Deceleration. Um, um, repetitive variable. Repetitive. Yes, very good. It's still repetitive variable, no? Okay, so let me see if the answer they give is correct. So this is the the old the old. Uh, so we have to change something from it. Okay, I I remove this. This is more than thirty minutes. Okay. Oh, I <laughs> I'm so sorry. I was not able to remove the the amber, the red, and the red. Okay, so this is an amber tachycystole. Okay, our baseline heart rate of one seventy is a red feature. And repetitive variable deceleration is a red feature. So one red is already an abnormal CTG, okay? So case scenario three, this is our last case scenario. Uh, Premier Gravida was admitted with spontaneous onset of labor at 40 weeks plus six days of gestation. Oxytocin was commenced for failures to progress at five centimeter dilatation. Two hours after artificial rupture of membranes, clear amniotic fluid was noted and the CT G trace was commenced, okay? So here, I only want you to, to interpret the CTG, okay? So what is the baseline heart rate here? 100 to 110. 110. Okay, 100. 100, 110. 100. Yes, because this is 90, this is 110. 100 to 110, maybe. 100 to 110. Okay. Or contraction. Do you see any contraction? There was no contraction, right? Or what I'm thinking is that probably the toc tocometer or tocodynamometer is not placed properly because how can you not have contraction at 5 centimeter dilatation, right? So in this trace, there was no contraction, okay? 110, so it's okay. Variability, I forgot to ask. What is the variability? <laughs> less than five. It's, less yes, than it's five. Less than, okay, less than five. You already saw it. Oh, you're cheating. <laughs> there are accelerations, no decelerations, and the overall impression is normal because why? You only have one amber feature. Wait, wait, huh? Wait. This is an amber feature, right? Minimal variable deceleration. So the overall impression is what? Suspicious, right? Right or no? Yes, then right. Oh, right. Because no. One, one amber feature. Suspicious. Makes no. a, yes, yes, so this is wrong, okay? One amber feature is suspicious, okay? Okay, so you have any question about CTG? I hope that you will enroll in our course. This is how we conduct our courses, our live session. We call, uh, we summarize all the important portions. We tell you which one is important in the exam, which one we tell you uh, where to focus, okay? We gather all the resources and give it all to you at the same time. So you don't have to read from different sources, okay? So um, if you have any more questions about the course, uh, for the course enrollees already, I know I, I'm familiar with some of the names here. We are already, again, um, we have students here. So you will be provided with the recording and the PDF, okay? Yes, Dr. Adila, it will be uploaded in your website. For those who are not enrolled in the course, this is a free webinar, so you can check it on our YouTube channel or in the, on the Facebook, okay? And thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Dr. iPhone, you said it's a nice video. What's your name? 
Oh, the fees. Mafia, uh, back end team. Uh, Are you still there? Doctor? Can, can you... Yes, yes, dear. Uh, about the contraction, can you repeat the slide about the contraction, the first one of the beginning lecture? Wait, huh? About the contraction? Yeah. What about the contraction? Which one? About, about the, the number, we would put it into the contraction and about the intensity and interval. Ah, okay. Wait. The first slide. Yeah. Here. This one. You always count the contraction in 10 minutes, okay? So here's your 10 minute mark. One, two small square is one minute. So you have to count um, 20 minutes, uh, 20, 20 small squares. So here you can see that there are two to three contractions, okay? This is the duration. From the beginning to the end of the contraction is you call duration. From the beginning to the beginning of the next, you call it frequency. And the interval between contraction is you call it interval, okay? So what else is your question? The strength, this About is the, the strength. Number, uh, 95 and... Uh... Uh, the co computation of Montevideo units. Yeah, yeah. Wait. Adila, Dr. Adila, okay, wait, okay. So these are your contractions, okay? You'd have to ch check here the baseline, so 20, okay? And then you have to check here the height of the contraction. It is 95, okay, 100. So 95 minus 20 is 75. 95 minus 20 is 75. 52 minus 20 is 32. So when you add it all together, it's 182 Montevideo units. This is how you compute your Montevideo units. And the adjugate contraction is 200 or more Montevideo units, okay? Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Bushra, the baseline should be taken from the area wherein there is no acceleration or deceleration. So when you see uh, confusing, it should not be confused, you know, why? Because you immediately know which is the baseline, for example, here. You here, you have to draw a straight line here to get the baseline. You don't, you don't get the baseline at the area wherein there is an acceleration or deceleration. For example, in our exam scenario, uh, case scenario, okay? Let me show you. Those who attended late, please kindly just play the recording, okay? We cannot uh, spend, because after this we have a meeting. I, I, my colleagues are already waiting for me, okay? So here, for example, here. Here, okay, so you can see here, this would never be a baseline. I told you a while ago, a baseline should be 110 to 160. That's the normal heart rate of the fetus, okay? So when you see 80, it's either a maternal pulse or, or it is a deceleration, okay? So you should not be confused. Maybe are you are you telling me that you think the baseline is 80 and then these are acceleration? No, it's impossible. So the baseline is here, 170, 160 to 170. Okay, so and these are decelerations. Okay. Variability, how to get it? You get the variability, Dr. Harin, from the area we're in. There is no acceleration or no deceleration. For example, here. Okay, here. I mentioned to you that um, uh, one small square is 30, 30 seconds, right? One small square is 30 seconds. Let me go back to the minimal variability, types of variability. Dr. Harin. Okay, here. So this is 
one small square. You can see here one small square, okay? I told you one small square is like how many? You can see here 240, 210. So 210, 220, 230. You always look here, okay? So you will count here. 210, 220, 230, 240. So you know one small square going up is 10 bits per minute, okay? So if you can see, for example, this is the square and you can see like this, that means zero, one variability, okay, absent. If you see that, for example, this is the square, okay? And then you see oscillations like this, it is less than 10 because you know that this is 10 bits per minute. So this is minimal variability, one to five. If it is occupying half, because this is 10, if it is occupying half, then this is five, more than five bits per minute. So this is moderate. Okay, Dr. Harin, can you understand now? You have to know how many is one small square. You have to look at the numbers here. Okay, so this is 30, 40, 50, 60. So you know one small square. So you can see here, there's no movement. So this is zero, okay? Okay, I think uh, I'll give it back. I'll give you back uh, Mafia who is in the back end team with me. Some students are asking about the fees. Can you tell them about the fees before we call it a day? Yeah, sure. Uh, how many students are asking for a fee? Can you please write in the chat box if you have any queries? Because a few of our students are already our old students. So for old students, we have special discount. So I just wanted to check that. How many new students do we have? Yes, uh, for next 72 hours, we have 60% off and it's only for 72% off. After that, we'll not entertain any discounts. Okay, so Homera is new. Fatma, can you please hear me? Uh, can you please help Fatma? Fatma, uh, we have a discount, 60% off for all. How much, Mafia? How much is the Fatma, sure, regular? Homera already in the chat box. Mafia, how much is the regular fee without the discount? Okay, just give For me part one. So from just now, and yes, sixty percent off. You have sixty percent off. Wait, uh, Doctor Asma. Okay, well, they are computing the regular course. I think is um, how much is the regular course? Four hundred ninety nine US dollars. Or yes, so they can, uh, yeah, they can, act, the actual price is $4.99 and now okay. they can get, yeah, now they can get the course in $1.99. $4.99 times, um, yes. 40 percent. So yeah, you can only get it at 200, 199. The course yeah. is from today until the exam, Dr. Homaira. Yes, and moreover that, uh, Dr. Homera, uh, okay, she's asking for how long this is. This is a six-month course, including the pre-course activities. So uh, you can just uh, join now because we are just starting our live session from 2nd of February, 2023. Uh, Dr. Helman will gonna uh, teach you all physiology and students are already practicing their SBAs in the study group under guidance of our experts. So if you want to join now, Fatma, uh, Fatma already shared her number so you can... No, 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 you don't have to pay again. If you are already submitted the fees, why you would uh, pay again? Don't worry at all, Fatma. Fatma will sh uh, share the details for the new students, for uh, enrollees who are already are uh, registered students, they don't need to pay anything. Just remember that for the students who are already in all enrolled our co in our course, you must be in the study group, which is on Facebook. If you don't have access to that group, please let me know. Even Fatma is there to help you out. Uh, as well so please be in the study group because we uh, discuss all the important points all the session links as we practicing and high yields points everything will be shared in the study group page two and must be in the study group okay we have already shared the study group link as a reminder again today with our students okay okay i think we have to end it mafia because yes, we have yes. a meeting 
Yeah, maybe we have Dr. Helmi is already waiting, <laughs> Dr. Helmi and Dr. Rami. And yeah, Dr. yeah. I just received a message from Dr. Helmi as well. So we're just going to wind up our session. Thank you so very much, everybody, for joining in. Thank you so very much, Dr. Deji, for this wonderful session and helping us students out. So pre-library link already shared in the group. And still, if you have any queries, we have our Facebook page. You can directly message us uh, there. We have shared our number as well. You can just write med exam expert on Facebook page. Then you'll be able to reach us out. Okay. Thank you so very much. Have a good day. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you for attending the session. Uh, no, 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 Dr. Duha, this is a mentors meeting. We have a mentors yeah. meeting after my session. Yeah, yes, because we have a session. We have to, uh, we have a live session. So we have to uh, get, uh, give our students the best. So that's why we have to do a meeting for all of you. So you can Thank pass you. your welcome, exam. Welcome. Good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a nice Friday, everyone. Bye-bye.